In this video, we're going to continue talking about equitable tracing. And specifically, we mentioned at the end of the previous video about two specific circumstances. One, which is where the property remains in the hands of the defaulting trustee or fiduciary. And the second is where the property has passed onto and into the hands of a third party. So we're going to talk about equitable tracing in both of those contexts in this video and the next. So this video specifically talks about the situation where property remains with the trustee. Okay, so this is really to do about uh, situations where the trustees mix his money taken from the trust with property that is beneficially his or her own. Now, the attitudes of the court could be best explained as selecting the approach which achieves the most desirable result for the beneficiaries under the trust, which has had its funds misapplied. So in short, the court appears to be seeking to achieve a just result and therefore selecting the approach which gets them there most efficiently. So mixed with trustees money. Now this is a situation where the fiduciary or trustee takes money from the trust fund and mixes it with their own money. The doctrine of the honest trustee assumes that where a trustee has mixed trust money with his own and that some of the money is spent on items of value such as shares and other money dissipated, the trustee has invested the trust money and invested his own. Now, the problem with uh, co-mingling the trustee's own money with the trust property is deciding whether property acquired with money from the mixture is to be treated as having been taken from the trust or has been has been taken from the trustee's own money. Now, on the basis that the trustee is required to invest trust property to achieve the best possible return for the trust, and that's seen from the Cohen and Scargill case from 1985, and on the basis that uh, the trustee is required to behave honestly in respect of the trust fund, the court may choose to assume that the trustee intended to use the trust property to make successful investments and her own money for any inferior investments. So in other words, the court can decide either way to determine whether the investment was made from his own pocket, for example, where the investment is bad, such as things for his own personal enjoyment, or from the trust fund itself, for example, where the investment is good, such that um, you have a stock that is doing particularly well. And so we have this case of Rehalis Estate from 1879. And in this case, a solicitor sold shares he was holding in trust and paid the proceeds into his own bank account. It was held on the death of the solicitor that the client was entitled to recover from the bank account. So the doctrine of the honest trustee and the approach of the court to this doctrine is most clearly exhibited in this case. So Hallett was a solicitor who was a bailey of Russian bonds for one of his clients, Cotterill, and Hallett sold the bonds and paid all of the proceeds into his own bank account. Now, Hallett then died as, um, subsequently, and therefore it was left to Cotterill to claim proprietary rights over the money in Hallett's bank account. And it was held that it could be assumed where a trustee has money in a personal bank account to which um, trust money is added, that the trustee is acting honestly when paying money out of the bank account. So therefore, it is assumed that the trustee is paying out of her own money on investments which lose money and not the trust money. Therefore, it is said that the trustee has rightfully dissipated her own monies such that the trust money remains intact. The beneficiaries were entitled to claim either equitable title in the assets require, um, acquired by the trustees or a lien over that asset. And that's just a, a right to take possession of property until one is paid what one is owed. In the modern language of the law of trusts, we might argue that this recognises the basis of the trust in the conscience of the trustee. Therefore, not only is the court assuming that the trustee was acting honestly, but it is also applying the tenets of equity so as to require 
him to act honestly. That is, by holding that any benefit to derive from the benefit held would be passed to the beneficiaries. Now, by the same token, it might be said that an investment in successful investments would be deemed to be an investment made out of the trust property, which is what we're going to see in the case of Oatway in a minute. So, to take an example of this approach in operation, let's imagine that a trustee has taken property from a trust fund and mixed it with her own money in her own bank account. Now, if that mixture of money was then used, um, you know, half to pay for an expensive meal and half to buy shares, the court would assume that the trustee was acting honestly and based on this sort of convenient fiction, would attribute the valuable shares to the trust fund and the money dissipated on the meal to the trustee's own money. In this way, the trust is able to recover the shares from the trustee and thus recoup the value of the trust fund. Now, one way of thinking about this doctrine is an extension of the remedy of specific restitution for breaches of trust by trustees, whereby the trustee is required to recover the trust's property. Hallett is effectively going one step further by allowing the trust, although technically not the trust as it has no legal personality, but used for shorthand purposes, to establish an equitable interest in the property acquired with the original trust property. Okay, and so uh, we also have um, this situation of lowest intermediary balance and or in lowest intermediate balance, sorry. And this is where a mixed bank account contains trust funds and other money, whether the other money belongs to an innocent third party or the person in breach, then money which has been dissipated and is hence untraceable cannot be replaced by money put into the account later. Now, because this is a proprietary right, it attaches to the property, and that means if there is no property, the right disappears. Okay, so if you have a mixed bank account, the maximum amount that can be taken from the bank account is the lowest intermediate balance. Okay, you cannot replace trust money with other money paid in later. Let's say, you know, a trustee puts £1,000 of trust money into his own bank account and dissipates it, then places another £1,000 of his own money into the same account the claimant cannot trace into the money deposited later. Okay, The maximum amount that can be reclaimed from the bank balance is the lowest intermediate balance. The claimant will, however, still have a personal claim against the trustee. So tracing wouldn't be possible because the money has been dissipated and cannot be recovered, but you would still have a personal claim against the trustee. And we have this case of James Roscoe, from 1915 and in this case a man who had bought a grocery business called uh, the unpaid called in the unpaid accounts due at the time of sale holding them on trust for the seller he paid the money into his own account spending most of it so that the account stood at one point at 25 pounds money was later paid in resulting in a balance of 358 pounds at his death it was held that the seller could not claim more than £25 from the deceased bank account. So the trust fund had been mixed with private monies in a bank account and the credit balance reduced at one point to £25 before being replenished. The seller could not claim more than £25 because the money was used to replenish, that was used to replenish the account could not be said to have been trust property. Okay, so that is the sort of situation of the lowest intermediate balance. And we've also got this rule in Clayton's case, uh, which is this case of uh, Noble from 1816. And in Clayton's case, a first in, first out rule was adopted. That is, that payments into an account and out of an account were set off against each other in the order in which they occurred. So if the mixed funds in the bank account represent the funds of two trusts or of a trust of an innocent volunteer, the rule in Clayton's case will apply. 
Now, the Bald and Clayton's case lays down that in the case of a current bank account, the first payment in is appropriated to the earliest debt, which is not statute barred. In other words, first in, first out. So, put another way, when deciding which property has been used to acquire which items of property, it is deemed that the money first deposited is used first. So, if a trustee, let's say, takes £1,000 from one beneficiary and puts it into his own account on the 1st of June and takes another £1,000 from a second beneficiary on the 3rd of June, then on the 5th of June dissipates you know, £1,000 for personal use. The first beneficiary will have no equitable right to trace, but the second beneficiary will have an equitable tra- um, right to trace the full remaining £1,000. Nevertheless, the first beneficiary will still have a personal claim against the trustee. And let's just say um, in another way, in other words, if a trustee places £10,000 belonging to Trust A into a current account that already holds £10,000 belonging to Trust B, it is important to to determine which trust is entitled to the £10,000 balance of the account if the trustee withdraws the other £10,000 and spends it on, you know, a luxury uh, luxury cruise, for example. Now, applying the rule in Clayton's case to this dispute, it will be trust A, trustee A, uh, or trust A, sorry, who is entitled to the entire balance in the account. Now, this rule doesn't really seem fair, but it was designed mainly for convenience sake. And you know, it has even been uh, uh, described as a convenient rule, a very convenient rule. It's it's something which just works in practice. And, you know, although it has been criticised quite a lot, it is settled law. So Clayton's case and the rule in Clayton's case does apply. Okay, and in this particular case then, uh, a case was brought against the estate of a banker who had previously been in a partnership. While he was a member of the partnership, the bankers had, in breach of fiduciary duty, sold treasury bills worth £1,035 deposited by Clayton and kept the proceeds for their own use. However, Clayton continued to deal with the bank and drew out sums greater than the amount converted by the bankers. It was held that Clayton could have no claim against the estate in respect of the £1,035 as that debt was set against the later drawings. Okay. As applied in tracing, the rule in Clayton's case meant that if a trustee in breach of trust paid £1,000 from one trust account into his own account and later £2,000 from a second account into his own account, then dissipated £1,500 from the account, £1,000 of the payment of £1,500 would be attributed to the first payment and £500 to the second breach of trust. The beneficiary of the first trust would have no tracing claim at all, while the beneficiary of the second trust would be able to recover £1,500 of his lo- uh, of his loss. So the first beneficiary would have no claim at all in such a circumstance. Now, this does seem quite unfair, but it is the law and is applied in some circumstances. I'm conscious that, you know, this is quite difficult to understand and I don't think you're going to necessarily get this first time round. So you may want to watch this video a couple of times and ask me some questions if you have any. I'm thinking about sort of um, creating a separate video to sort of break down this these concepts even further. So if you are interested in that sort of video, then please do let me know. Now, we've also got this case of Barlow Close International and Vaughan from 1992. And in this case, the the later depositors into a fraudulent investment scheme argued that uh, the rule should apply, that the money dissipated should be attributed to the early investors, while the money remaining should be attributed to to the later investors. And this would mean that they would have a greater claim on the money that was remaining than the earlier investors. 
So in this case, an investment company went into liquidation, leaving insufficient funds to satisfy the claims of all its investors. Now, the investors were fighting over the money remaining in the investment fund. The Court of Appeal held that the rule might apply where there was a clear intention that the funds should be separately invested. But in this case, it was clear that the investors were all investing in a common fund. Furthermore, the rule should not be applied where it would be impractical or result in injustice for some of the investors. So the rule in Clayton's case was reaffirmed in this case as the prima facie rule, although it was also said that, being a rule of convenience, it will not be applied if to do so would be impracticable or result in injustice. Now this case, according to the Court of Appeal, was one case in which the Clayton's case should not be applied. If the investors made a clear intention that the funds were to be invested separately, the rule in Clayton's case would likely have applied, but here it was clear the investors were investing in a common fund, thus meaning that it would not be practical or just to apply the rule in Clayton's case here. The majority of the Court of Appeal favoured a distribution between the rights of the various investors on a pari passu basis, considering Clayton's case too formalistic and arbitrary for this scenario. So the assets were thus ordered to be distributed pari passu among all unpaid investors rateably in proportion to the amounts due to them. So although the majority of investors approved this pari passu method, Leggett and Wolf, the judges here, also applied a rolling charge approach culled from, a, from different Canadian cases, which we're going to look at in just a second. So a distribution of pari passu is a distribution of the assets in proportion to the contribution that each contributor made, whereas a rolling charge method is slightly different. Now, a similar result was reached in this case of IMB Morgan from 2004. And in that case, um, it was held that the rule in Clayton's case would not be applied irrespective of the party's intention if it would produce an unjust result. In fact, the so-called rule in Clayton's case is now, nowadays so often disapplied in the interest of justice that one judge has renamed it the exception in Clayton's case. That is um, from Russell Cook Trust and Prentice from 2003. So just to finish this off, I do want to quickly mention the rolling charge. And this is an alternative means of allocating the property between beneficiaries. Um, and in this method, each payment out of the account is allocated pari passu to the beneficial owners of the property at the time of the payment. So it is suggested that the rolling charge approach is the more sensible approximation to the contribution in which each good faith, in um, each good faith investor has made to the fund. Um, so rather than looking to which investor contributed their money first and which contributed their money last, which is you know always a result of chance, it seems more equitable to resort to the resulting trust principle that each should take according to their proportionate size of their contributions. The rolling charge means that investors would have to take into account um, in Barlow Close case, not only the size of their contribution to the fund, but also the length of time for which that money was part of the fund. Clearly, the longer an investment is made, the more money it could be expected to make. The only problem with the rolling charge method is that it is extremely complex. It requires basically reconstruction of every single transaction carried out by the account. You have to look at every payment in and out of the fund, and from a forensic accounting point of view, this is quite challenging. This method goes on the basis that where funds or several depositors or sources have been blended in one account, each debit to the account, unless unequivocally attributable to the monies of one depositor or source, for example, as if an investment was purchased for one, should be attributed to all the depositors so as to reduce all their deposits pro rata. Instead of being attributed as under Clayton's case, 
to the earliest deposits in point of time. So the court accepted the rolling charge as, in principle, a better way of doing things. So Dylan here, in this case, is saying that every time there is a payment out, you have to determine who owned the fund at that time. For example, 20% is attributed to you, so reduces your debt proportionately. So although in theory it makes sense, they wouldn't apply it in this case because it was impractical. This requires a complicated analysis of the payments out of the account in question, and although it has been acknowledged as the theoretical, most equitable way of determining each claimant's beneficial interest in the remaining property, it has never been applied by an English court. Now, we have these other cases though. We got this Charity Commission and Frangie from 2014, where the court used a pari passi distribution uh, to, um, in this case, but accepted that it was open to the court to use the rolling charge. So this was about the distribution of funds following the charity going bust. And the court was open to using the rolling charge method here. The charity in this case raised money on behalf of other charities and then passed the money on to the charities. So they got into financial trouble and then went into liquidation. All the charities for whom they had raised the money were trying to get their hands on as much money as they could from the funds in this case. And then we've also got this Dollar Land Holdings case from 1995. And in this particular case, a claimant who had made a single large payment was able to trace his specific debt through a mixed fund into a specific transfer. The size of the payment uh, me meant that it could be identified in later transactions. So this was a highly visible transaction, 10 million pounds went in and 10 million pounds went out. So it was easily traceable. But in principle, that is probably wrong. Um, if you're going to identify big transactions, you should probably try to identify them all. And just to finish this video off, we can talk about the beneficiary's right of election. So where an asset has been bought by the trustee in breach of trust, then the beneficiaries may elect to accept the asset as trust property or take a lien over the property against the trust against the trustee and the lien is just a, a right to take possession of property until one is paid what one is owed now in Oatway the trustee held 4077 pounds in a personal bank account the trustee then added 3000 pounds of trust money to this account out of the £7,077 held in the account, £2,137 was spent on purchasing shares. The remainder of the money in the bank account was then dissipated. The beneficiary sought to trace from the £3,000 taken out of the bank into the shares and then to impose a charge over those shares. The shares themselves had risen in value um, to £2,474. Pound. The beneficiaries also sought a further accounting in cash to make up the balance um, £3,000 taken from the trust fund. Now it was held that where a trustee had wrongfully mixed her own money and trust money, the trustee is not entitled to say that the investment was made with her own money and the trust money had been dissipated. Importantly though, the beneficiaries are entitled to elect either that the property be subject to a charge as security for amounts owed to them by the trustees, that is a lien, or that the unauthorised investments be adopted as part of the trust fund. In other words, they can accept or elect the unauthorised investment as theirs and part of the trust fund, or they can simply hold the unauthorised investment as security for amounts owed to them by the trustee. It is therefore clear that the courts are prepared to protect the beneficiaries at all costs from the misfeasance of the trustee, re-emphasizing the strictness of the trustee's obligations to the beneficiaries. So on the facts of Oatway, the beneficiaries were able to elect to have the valuable shares subsumed into the trust, as opposed to simply to taking rights over the money, which 
was to their advantage because it was considered likely that those shares would increase in value in the future. And also to be able to require the trustees to account in cash for the remaining shortfall in the balance taken from the trust fund. In effect, based on the principles of breach of trust spelled out in target holdings, requiring a trustee to reconstitute the value of the trust fund. Okay, so that's going to be the end of this video. I am well aware that this is a difficult topic and I'm not entirely sure how well I've described this and explained this. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have about this and on the different, you know, particular areas surrounding um, mixed funds when it comes to equitable tracing. I'm also conscious that uh, the distinction between Clayton's case, Parry Passu and rolling charges isn't so clear in this video. So if you want me to create a document or a separate video on the distinction between um, these three things, then I'd be more than happy to do that as well. So just let me know in the comment section below and I will reply as soon as I can. But if you enjoyed the video, then make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.